All right, so you guys, we've been going through this series on uh, called Extraordinary, and it's really taking a look at a whole bunch of great men of the faith and looking at their humble beginnings. And the reason we're doing that is, you know, I mean, when you read the Bible, when you see, you know, stories about guys like David or Joshua or Moses, we just get the feeling that, well, God must have put them in the Bible so they were these non-typical people. They were special. And uh, it's just interesting that, that God makes it very clear that they were just as messed up as we are. But as we start looking at some of these guys that are considered by the church to be great men of the faith and look at their lives, you start realizing that God can take anybody who was willing just to turn their lives over to him and do something absolutely amazing with it. And that's really the reason that we're going through this, how he can take something ordinary and move them towards extraordinary. And, you know, we've seen guys that, that had sixth grade educations become the most amazing authors that the Christian church has ever known. We've seen guys who were in prison who become evangelists. We've seen guys that, you know, I mean, we, we even got the, the cross-eyed preacher. Remember that guy? You know? Can you imagine standing up in front of 10,000 people, speaking without a mic and being cross-eyed? I mean, you'd want to be just in the front row to watch that, wouldn't you? It's like, dude, look at that, <laughs> you know? So anyway, today I want to introduce you to a guy named Daniel Rowland. And uh, watch his video with me, and then we'll spend a couple of minutes talking about who he was and then what kind of impact he had. So go ahead and run that if you would, guys. We have developed a system that we would rather continue with the system to even think about the consequences of what we're doing. We need to get back to the ancient ways. I believe the message of the gospel is unchanging. We're here in the small village of Llangaetho, located in mid Wales. This quiet village was once the scene of extraordinary events. It became the epicenter of a great awakening in the 18th century. It's difficult today for us to imagine the scenes which were recorded by the eyewitnesses. Thousands gathered for those special days when the pastor preached and administered the Lord's Supper. People came from neighboring towns. Some walked as far as 40 miles over the difficult terrain, some further. Others traveled by ship down the coast. One of the early leaders wrote, A summer's day has dawned on the land. God pours down his presence. It is as the days of the apostles. Another exclaimed, The Lord comes down among us in such a manner as words can give no idea of. Time seemed irrelevant in their gatherings. They understood that they were meeting the living God. This wasn't merely a time of emotional fervor. Lives were lastingly changed. One man recorded the difference that the revival made upon the people. He writes, the shepherds sing hymns in the valleys, the plowman and the driver of his oxen sing psalms together in the fields. The maidens, the children, and the old men sit together discussing happily the works of the spirit of grace. And it wasn't only adults that were affected. In 1768, the minister of this town noted that 140 children were meeting weekly to pray and sing and open their hearts to one another. Nor was this an isolated phenomenon. The early leaders were aware that God was doing similar things in Europe, England, Scotland, and America. They kept abreast of the revival's progress in other countries by a network of personal correspondence. It was truly an international movement that brought about the renewal of a vibrant and attractive Christianity that challenged the skepticism and hypocrisy of the day. While many were used of God in the Welsh revivals, the leading voice of the movement was the man who ministered here in Tlangaitho from 1734 till his death in 1790. 
His memory has been honored by the statue beside me. His name was Daniel Rowland. Most Christians outside Wales haven't heard of Daniel Rowland. Born in 1711, ordained in 1734, he became a minister in the Church of England and began his labors here. His early ministry was not particularly beneficial to the people. He was worldly and frivolous. His sermons focused on moral duty and church ceremony. At this point in his life, he was still a stranger to that work of God which brings about the new birth. In fact, spiritually, Wales was a dark land, but there were exceptions. One of these was Griffith Jones. He was an earnest minister in a church 30 miles from here. It was through his preaching that Daniel Rowland was confronted with the God that he did not know. For that part of our story, we need to take a five-mile drive to the neighboring village of Tlandewi Brevi. In the winter of 1734, Griffith Jones was here preaching at St. David's Church. The building was too small to hold the crowds, so he preached outside with the people standing in the cemetery. Daniel Rowland and a number of his parishioners came to hear Jones. It was a sermon that Rowland would never forget. Years later, an account of what happened was published. It reads, One time when Jones was preaching in a churchyard, he saw a young man in the crowd who appeared restless and rebellious. He observed him for a moment, pointed at him, and with an expression of gentle compassion, exclaimed, Oh, for a word to reach your heart, young man. And who was this but Daniel Rowland? That sermon was instrumental in leading him to Christ. Everything about the young minister was affected by this encounter with God. This was the living God, the Holy One, the monarch of heaven and earth. His claims upon humanity were indisputable. Roland now viewed sin as a great offense against God's glory. He was no longer the worldly, frivolous minister. There was great power in this new preaching. People started coming from distant villages to hear him. His sermons focused on the unapproachable holiness and majesty of God. Roland was so fierce in his condemnation of sin that he was nicknamed the angry minister. He preached the law of God, demonstrating that it touched not only their outward behavior, but also their motives. He enlarged on the terror of the law's threats. It was as if this man had seen the holy God and could not but tell the people of their danger. Soon his church was too small to hold the crowds who were coming to listen. So he preached in the churchyard and on the surrounding hillsides. For two years this continued until a faithful minister and friend, Philip Pugh, called Roland aside. Preach the gospel to the people, he advised him. Apply the blood of Christ to their spiritual wounds and show the necessity of faith in the crucified Savior. If you go on preaching the law in this manner, you will kill half the people in the country. The advice was taken. But little could anyone have known how extraordinary the outcome would be. The people were like plowed fields ready for the seed of the gospel. The harvest was remarkable. It is important to understand how the changes in Daniel Rowland's thinking about God changed his way of dealing with souls. Most of his evangelism was among those who were church members. In fact, 96% of the population was already baptized into the church. Their ministers assured them that the baptismal waters cleansed them and made them new. But Daniel Rowland understood better. His own experience of God stripping him of his self-righteousness before filling him with Christ's of God destroying his false peace before giving him true rest, was later confirmed by the study of the scriptures. He began to follow the Apostle Paul's pattern using the law of God to expose sin and wound the conscience before giving the healing words of the gospel. But conviction of sin was not the intended destination. Once the people felt their guilt, Roland would begin to plead with them to turn to Christ. He often rebuked them for not going immediately to God in repentance and faith. He told them, you shiver with cold when God is a fire. You are hungering with famine and Christ is all food. You are thirsty and he is water to refresh you. Come up then and don't stand off. In spite of extraordinary blessing on his ministry, Daniel Rowland never forgot that he was continually dependent on God's work. He wrote, mankind have brazen foreheads, adamantine necks, and ribs of marble around their hearts. They bleed not, bend not, blush not. The word is a hammer which breaks the rock within them and the Holy Spirit is a fire which dissolves and melts it. He was also keenly aware of his own soul's need 
for constant communion with God. He feared anything that would cause him to drift. He often prayed, Oh, may God draw me from every vain thing which saps my faith, cools my love, and makes me unfit for his holy work. When Daniel Rowland met God in this cemetery, it forced him to rethink how he reached out to the lost. This week, we had the opportunity to consider how beholding the God of the Bible will require us to rethink our evangelism. So this guy's a pretty unique character. Grew up on a farm, and uh, he loved hunting more than anything else. Matter of fact, <laughs> one, one, of the, one of the quotes about him is in his early life, he says, I love hunting more than God's word. Probably a bad thing to admit in front of God, right? But uh, it's interesting because at this time in the Church of England, obviously it's a church state, which means that if you're gonna go to church, you're gonna belong to the Church of England because that's the approved church. And all of a sudden, you gotta think of this mentality. As a young man, he's thinking, well, listen, I really love hunting. And if I, if I become a preacher, then I'll have to preach on Sunday and I'll probably have to do a little prep work on Saturday. That gives me Monday through Friday to go hunting. Not a bad plan. And that's what his plan was. And so all of a sudden he takes that plan and he goes off to college so he can get his degree. Isn't it amazing that you take a guy, you run him through a college that teaches them how to be a minister, a pastor, clergy, and he still doesn't know Christ. Guys, it happens. It happens a lot, actually. You know, there's this difference between head knowledge and the trust in your heart. And uh, so anyway, so he, he goes down the process. He's going to be a preacher. He's going to keep hunting, having a great time, enjoying his life. And he gets this little church, okay? And he's in this little church now, and he's, he's, he's going by the book. And, you know, he's not preparing for sermons. He's opening the book and going to page 42 because this week is page 42, and all he is preaching about is, is having good morals and church ceremony. And that's what he talks about. He talks about the culture of the day. And guess what? His church goes from this big to this big to this big, and his church is shrinking. And he can't figure out what's going on. And so finally he hears some people in his church talking, and they're going to a neighboring village just like five miles away, because there's this other preacher, Griffith Jones, who is a nonconformist, okay? I even like the sound of that. It's just like, yeah, he must be a rebel from the Church of England. This nonconformist is actually preaching the gospel. And so, by the way, you gotta understand that, that, that Daniel Rowland is probably 22, 23 years old when he becomes a pastor of this church. And so, he does what any 23 year old does, right? I'm going to go check out the competition. The guy's stealing my people. I'm going to go figure out how to blow him up. And so he shows up at this, this uh, that place that you saw, standing out in the graveyard, and I'm sure kind of hiding behind the tombstones, giving this guy the look, right? And all of a sudden, this guy starts preaching the gospel, and somehow or another, God leads his heart to look Daniel Rowland in the face, and, and, and with compassion, I'm sure it was, looked at him in the face and say. Oh, that, word, that God would get a word into your heart. You stubborn, stiff neck, stupid. Nah, he probably didn't go down that road. But the fact is, is he, that, that Daniel Rowland got that message loud and clear. The part that you didn't hear in there is that he was just visiting that church area where, where Griffith Jones lived was about 30 miles from where Daniel Rowland lived. And three days a week after his conversion, Daniel Rowland would walk the 30 miles to his place to get discipled and then walk back. And so all of a sudden, you have this kind of unique circumstance that God led this, led this young man into to give him the truth and to start developing in the truth. So he comes back and he starts preaching what he's learned. Well, just like any of us on this walk of faith, the minute that you accept the Lord, you don't know everything, right? And so he starts preaching, but now he's not using, this, uh, using the book anymore. He was still using the Bible, not using the, the sermon book, okay? And what he starts preaching is what he knows. And so he starts preaching to his church basically fire and brimstone stuff. 
If you don't be saved, you're going to hell. You're going to suffer. You're going to die. You know, you got all this sin in your life. You need to deal with it. And by the time that this other preacher gets a hold of him and goes, oh, time out, big guy. You got to tell him the good news, too. You can't just tell him the bad news. Matter of fact, you remember the remark that the guy said. He says, if you keep going like this, Daniel, you're going to have half of the country wanting to commit suicide because they're so distraught that they can't deal with their own sin and guilt. He says, give them the blood of Christ, teach them the gospel. And by that time, by the way, isn't it interesting that as he is just talking about all the, the results of your sin, the fact that you can be destroyed, the fact that you're going to be judged, the more he talks about that, the more his church grows. Thinking maybe the Scottish people were, were in need of this, you think? And all of a sudden, now Daniel Rowland makes his transition. That's how we got the nickname as the angry minister. <laughs> Wouldn't that be a good one to put on the front of your church? Hey, come here and come to our church and hear the angry minister talk about how you're going to hell. I'm thinking we'd have people pulling in the parking lot, skidding in, right? Well, interestingly enough, God drew people to that place. And when he started sharing the gospel, there was just this explosion. And so it's just interesting the way that God has used him and, and used the circumstances that he was in to just have a, a pretty amazing impact. By the way, this conversion was a conversion way down deep in his heart, gave him nothing but trouble with the Church of England. As a matter of fact, the other, the other clergymen around him in other villages with the Church of England are not happy with him because all of a sudden there are people leaving their churches and going to hear him. And at one point, the, the clergyman come to him and say, hey, you gotta quit doing this. You gotta quit preaching to our people. And the, and the thing that he said was, huh, here's the deal. You're not preaching the gospel. You're not giving them the truth. I need to go where people need to hear the gospel. Well, that didn't go over well with the church in England. It's just a couple of short years later that the Church of England actually pulls his license. Says, you're no longer a part, you're no longer a pastor, you're no longer a minister or preacher, you can't do this. And guess what? A bunch of men like you guys in his church in Glengatho says, no problem. They go down the block and build a whole new church and say, this is your church. Name it what you want. <laughs> and so all of a sudden, he is now preaching, and by the way, it's, it's not a huge city. It's just this rural village. They build a church that holds 3,000 people. Just to give you some perspective, this church here, with all the chairs laid out and all that stuff here, holds about 1,500 if you pack every seat. So all of a sudden, we're talking a church twice his size in this little village in Scotland, and God's filling it up. And so it just, it's just really interesting to think. The other thing that I wanted to pull out there that, uh, oh, by the way, in conjunction with this, he's got guys threatening him. He's got guys that tried to beat him up. He actually at one point had a guy that pulled a gun on him, put it to his head, and squeezed the trigger. Fortunately, it was a flint lock, and it misfired. It's like, hmm, okay. I think maybe it was an angel with his finger in a, in a plug in there. But, but still... Guys, here's the thing. God got a hold of this young man's heart and took it all the way. So this morning, what I want to share with you, though, is the thing. I mean, we've been trying to find the one thing about, about each one of these men that God has really drilled down to. And, and the one thing I want to share with you guys this morning is that, that Daniel Rowland's gift, the thing that God gave to him, was this awareness of what God was like in his life. And one of the things that you got to understand, which is not dissimilar from our culture, is that he was preaching to a culture that considered themselves Christians. I think they said in the video, 96% were baptized. But they were going to church where people says, well, because you're baptized, you're saved, you don't have to worry about anything. And so they were living life on their terms. So the first thing I want to share with you this morning is a couple of verses. The very first thing that he became aware of was that he was preaching to people who thought they were saved. And one of the things that he preached, one of the things that really became important to him was against this gospel of self-righteousness. 
And so I'm going to have you put your belts up tight and pull your britches up and listen this morning because this may challenge some of you guys. And I want to be up front and right direct with you so you understand. I'm not trying to beat you up, not trying to make you doubt your salvation, but you need to evaluate where you sit in this thing. Because even in this day and age, there are some people who are so self-righteous, they think they're going to heaven because of their own righteousness. And so I want to take you to a verse this morning in Hebrews in chapter 10. By the way, this is probably not one you will ever hear many sermons on in a big church or any other church for that matter. Because this is talking to Christians about their lifestyle and those who keep to, or choose to keep on sinning. And so the author of Hebrews is talking to believers and he says in verse 26 of chapter 10, it says, if we deliberately keep on sinning, after we have received the knowledge of the truth, no sacrifice for sins is left. Saying, listen, if you're a believer and you're living this life with this secret sin, where you are still involved in doing the stuff that you know you're not supposed to do, you are discrediting the name of Christ. You're saying, Jesus, what you did is not that important. What I'm doing is important. And, and when you think about this, you, you know, really it is just an affront to Christ, affront to God saying, listen, you're not that important, I'm important. And so all of a sudden you get this, this concept and then look what it says in verse 27. This is the result of that kind of, I'm gonna keep on sinning, don't worry about it, God, attitude. It says, there's no sacrifice for sins left, but only a fearful expectation of judgment and of raging fire that will consume the enemies of God. Don't be mistaken, he's not talking about a bunch of unsafe sinners, guys. He's talking about a judgment for us. He wants you to know that the God of the universe is not to be trifled with. The God of the universe takes our lives and our behavior seriously. And so as he does that, this is the message that comes across. If you think your standard of living is the basis of your salvation, you're in the wrong place. It's God's standard of living. We talked about personal holiness a couple of weeks ago, and I think I mentioned this last week. God does not expect you to live a perfect life. He does, however, expect you to live a life to where when sin comes into it, you look at it and you see it from his perspective and you go, man, I am sorry, Lord, forgive me. Where we humble ourselves, we surrender our hearts and go, I realize that I got this junk in my life, please forgive me and cleanse it out of my life. See, that's a life lived with Christ working in us. When we get to the place where we go, well, you know, I'm not, so I'm not as bad as those other guys. Yeah, you know, I'm not as bad as the guys at that other table. Those guys are a really bad bunch of sinners. We're okay. That's the kind of self-righteousness that lulls us into this sense of false security. And see, Daniel Rowland got it. He understood that false security. The next verse in this section, though, is a couple of verses down. Is actually the same chapter, Hebrews 10. And in verse 29, it says, How much more severely... Do you think someone deserves to be punished who has trampled the Son of God underfoot, who has treated as an unholy thing the blood of the covenant that sanctified them, and who has insulted the Spirit of grace? Guys, there's some of you in here this morning that have some sin issues going on in your life that you have hidden for a long time. How do I know that? Because I was there. I can't tell you the amount of my life, the amount of time that I spent while I was in college playing football as a believer, the amount of time I was in the fire department as a believer, and you couldn't have told my life from the worst guy in the department, the worst guy on the team. I was so desirous of being accepted by that group of guys that I would even be worse than some of them just so I could prove that I was worthy of being part of their group. You know, and so I was living this false life. And this is what it looked like. I'd put a mask on Sunday morning and I'd come to church and people would say, how are you? Oh, I'm holy. Hallelujah. Amen. Learned all the right terms. But deep inside, I was as dark and as nasty and as dirty as you can imagine. And, you know, when I read this now, man, it just makes me shudder. When I realize 
that I was so insulting God and so insulting the work that Jesus did in my life that I did nothing but deserve punishment and that I was treating like an unholy thing the grace that saved me. Man, it's something that you got to deal with. So you're going to have an opportunity this morning to just spend some time because here's how you fix it. It's, it's not this big process. It's a matter of coming clean before the Lord and saying, you know what, I do have some junk in my life. I have some stuff that I've been hiding. I've been wearing this mask. And you can come clean. You just look, look God in the face and bow your head and ask him to forgive you and to cleanse you. And he'll do that. But this whole concept of self-righteousness, depending on our work and our ability, man, it's just a dangerous, dangerous way to go through life. The second part of this is, is that you realize, when you realize that you have that kind of junk in your life, automatically with that comes guilt and shame. And you know, you, the reason I know I'm saved is that whole period of time when I was acting just like the world, I could hear God's voice in the back of my head. I could feel his finger on my shoulder going, Richard, what the heck are you doing? You don't, just knock it off. You're doing the wrong thing. There was not a time when I was doing that where I was like, oh yeah, this is no big deal. I knew, I knew every moment of the way that God was saying, knock it off. I gotta tell you, in some senses, I'm surprised that he didn't knock me off and take me home and just say, hey, you know what? You ain't worth the effort, you know? Now, my salvation was secure, but boy, my behavior sure wouldn't have proved it. So here's the other part of this. You feel this guilt and shame. It says in Psalms, it says, because of your wrath, this is God's wrath. By the way, this is a psalm when David is talking to God about the results of his sin with Bathsheba and killing Uriah the Hittite. This is how he looked at it. He says, because of your wrath, God, there is no health in my body. There is no soundness in my bones because of my sin. My guilt has overwhelmed me like a burden too heavy to bear. He felt shame. He felt guilt. And God used that to bring him back. Interestingly enough, it's amazing how shame works in our lives. There's some young guys in here this morning. I want to talk to you for just a second. The decisions you make as young guys in your life right now will impact the rest of your life. You're a young married guy. Those choices you make will affect your marriage. They'll affect your kids. Those choices you make as a high schooler will affect your whole life. I'm going to tell you right now, you have the opportunity, you have the power, you have the God, you have the support system around you to keep you from making those stupid decisions. If you don't make them, you don't have to live with the pain and punishment they cause. Because just because you're a follower of Christ does not get you out of the punishment. It gets you out of the ultimate price. But you can't sin right now and not have it affect your life and other people's lives. You're surrounded by a bunch of guys who have lived through some life and understand the fact that, guess what? It does cost. And I'm here to testify to that. So, but I want to talk to the other guys for a minute. There are some of you in here who deal with shame and guilt over the stuff you've done and you've never let it go. Matter of fact, you have allowed that sin and that guilt and that shame to prevent you from walking with God. Oh, I'm not worthy to be forgiven. Oh, I am so bad I can't be forgiven. Let me tell you, that's every bit as bad as living this life of continual sin because you again are looking at Christ and saying, what you did is not enough. Now, if I left it there, you guys would go home being depressed. I should get an amen somewhere in there. I don't want you to go home being depressed. I want you to go home with a, an excitement about this because the last part of this is, uh, is applying the blood of Christ. And this is, this is what, what, uh, what Daniel Rowland became a master at doing, was helping people see that once you get to the place where you acknowledge that you're, you're sin, you acknowledge your guilt and shame, then all of a sudden we can apply the blood of Christ to this. And in Hebrews 10, 22, it says, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart, okay, full of assurance that faith brings. It says, full of assurance that faith brings. Having our hearts sprinkled 
to cleanse us from our guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water. See, here's the deal. You do not have to live under that burden of sin. You don't have to live wearing the mask. You can take that mask and throw it away and just be who God made you to be. Forgiven, loved, cared for, with purpose, with direction. And all you have to do is humble yourself before the Lord and ask him to forgive you and continue walking in that. The last verse I want to share with you is actually out of Romans 5, 8, 9, and you guys have probably recognized this. But God demonstrated his love towards you while you were still sinners. Okay? Christ died for you. He died for us while we were still sinners. And then in the end of this, in verse 9, he says, since we have now been justified by his blood. Justified means that in a court of law, there is no longer any penalty for all of that sin. We've been justified by his blood. How much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? See, here's, here's the thing. As you think about this process, you need to look at yourself and say, am I being the real guy? Am I really living a life that's pure and holy before the Lord, or do I have a ton of stuff? Probably, I th- you know, I told you two weeks ago when we were talking about personal holiness that uh, that's a quote that really got me then was that the pastor of that church said the thing that his people needed more than anything was his personal holiness. Well, this is kind of the next step. The last quote I want to share with you this morning is this. It says, Daniel Rowland realized his ability to go back to that sinful place at any time. And this was his prayer. It says, draw me from every vain thing which saps my faith or cools my love and makes me unfit for your holy work. Guys, God has holy work for each and every one of us. He doesn't mean that you all have to be preachers. What he means is no matter where you are, what circumstance you're in, what job you're in, he has holy work for you to do. And what he wants is you to be fit for his service, and he's willing to help you. So this morning, as you talk around your tables, there's a few questions on there, but but they're really tough questions, and you're going to probably struggle with them. I challenge you guys to be honest this morning and just see how God wants to work in your lives. Father God, thank you for my brothers. Thank you for your word. Thank you for the example of Daniel Rowland and how he... uh, just impacted my life, just reading his history and learning a little bit about him. feel like I can relate to him. I I too would rather be out hunting than doing your work. But that's just my flesh, Lord. And when, when, when you realize how important your holy work is and that you actually invite us to be part of it, Lord, it's just something we want to do. God, thank you for uh, these men. Bless them this week. Protect them and uh, let your word sink deep down into their hearts today. In Jesus' name. Thank you.